I'm ready. Are we actually on, or uh, I still see Rick and, and Philip? Yep. We can start now. We can start okay. now. Well, I uh, want to welcome everyone who's here, uh, whether you're in the broader public and YouTube or whether you're here from MIT, um, for this very this panel discussion around playing in extreme environments. Um, it's one that uh, that we thought might be an interesting thing to think about as we're all into month six of sort of pandemic isolation um, because we have two panelists here who are thinking about much more long-term survival in extreme in is extreme isolation. Um, and so uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself and then uh, I'm Scott Osterwell. I'm the creative director at the MIT Education Arcade. I'm a game designer by trade. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna be the your host on this panel. The two experts are, are, are uh, here, I'm gonna invite them to each just introduce yourself and just quickly sort of your job title, uh, sort of what you do. And then in the conversation, we'll get into the details about your work. But um, just, uh, I guess, going alphabetically, Ariel, do you wanna start first? Sure. Hello everyone, I'm Ariel Ekblaw. I'm the founder and director of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative. And we work on prototyping and building the artifacts of our shared life in space. Really looking forward to talking to you today. And Dorit. Hi everybody, my name is Dorit Donneville. I'm based in uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and I run a NASA funded institute called the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. We fund uh, R&D around making sure that when humans go to Mars, they're gonna do so safely. Great, and we'll get into detail about all of this. Um, I wanted to start out because obviously what you are both doing is thinking very far, you're thinking about a future that's still hard to for most of us to really visualize. We, I mean, we've all seen plenty of science fiction, but um, we really, you're thinking about how to get from here to there. And I guess the very first question that I had was how much of what you do is sort of real nuts and bolts planning for some sort of imminent future versus sort of creative sort of blue sky thinking. Um, and what's the balance between those two? And, you know, um, Feel free to okay. both. Okay. You, you know, I, yeah. I guess I'll go first this time. We'll, we can trade back and forth, Ariel. Um, actually, Ariel and I collaborate together. So uh, there's common things that we do together as well. So it's a great question. Um, so as you know, the very best science and technology development uh, integrates the two very closely. So uh, we, we have to think about the sci-fi sort of as a place for inspiration and the needs as well. And, you know, uh, who would have imagined the technologies that we have today, they were en envisioned uh, back in the Star Trek days, you know, today is Star Trek day. So I want to say happy Star Trek day to everybody. But I, I was born in the sixties and I watched that show and, you know, the communicator, the, 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 you know, the medical bay, the, all those things that were envisioned back then come to fruition eventually. So I think that we use play and creativity to imagine a future and then we go about making that a reality and so we incorporate both of those things uh, in our work every day. Heartily seconded I'll say that I grew up watching TNG so Star Trek Next Generation and we are very much inspired by this optimistic blue sky vision for the future of space and we are even thinking about framing ourselves as what does it look like to found a real life Starfleet Academy because not only was this the place where the cadets went to learn and play games and play simulations about space travel, it was also where the technology, the nuts and bolts, as you mentioned, of the, of the enterprise was built. And so we try to merge both of these different aspects into all of our work. And a great example is actually the zero gravity flight course that we're teaching at MIT this fall. I will say it's a shout out, it's fully virtual this year. And so we're putting all of the materials online. So people are more than welcome to follow along with us informally as we teach the class. This is a course that prepares graduate students to prototype, develop projects that will actually fly in microgravity on a plane based experience of weightlessness. And within the course, we do sessions on parabolic flight prep. So we have David Newman come in and talk to the students about preparing their bodies and the sensors that they're gonna to need to be able to pull it off. And then we also have lenses and we have people come in and talk about game design or art in space and what kind of other different artifacts would we now that we have this incredible opportunity to begin prototyping and building for life in space, what will actually help us move beyond a survivalist approach into a thriving 
approach for life in space. So we're really excited to be able to essentially merge the two together now. Um, so uh, that what that got me thinking about um, as you're talking about that is that something that I always try to talk, emphasize to my game design students that frequently the interesting design challenge is actually when you're confronted with ir what seem like irresolvable conflicts. When there's things that, um, that you, uh, you need X, but you also need Y, and those seem to be in complete tension. And it's the, the pleasure in design is sometimes when you can solve those. I realize this is not a question I'd prepped you with before, but have you thought about, so I'm gonna put you on the spot. Have you had those situations where you're thinking about sort of balancing two maybe things that seem uh, impossible to sort of balance um, in the way you think about it? Any examples of that? And again, I sort of springing this on you, so I don't know whether you've had time yeah. to think about that kind of thing. Um, yeah, if we want to keep alternating, I can take this one first and then, and then pass it on. Um, we do introduce and discover all kinds of interesting constraints when we're thinking about this environment. Um, one of the ones that we faced on last year's parabolic flight was we have a researcher who's thinking about the future of space food. How can space food be nutritious and practical and help with the astronaut you know, gut microbiome, but also bring a certain joy and connectedness so that we have this sense of mental health and the entire cultural you know, artifice that goes along with food. Well, she was told that she had to have complete containment for everything that she was going to do. And we don't typically eat in a box. <laughs> We're not used to that really at all on the surface of the earth. And so she designed, she took it as an opportunity at this, you know, being presented with what seems like an irreconcilable conundrum, being told by the company, you may not fly unless your food is contained and then your experience wanted to be free and, and using her hands. So she designed a beautiful de uh, a helmet essentially and an entire integrated suit. And this became an artifact that is part of the experience of having a meal. And she even designed, what are they called? Lazy Susans? Um, like a little rotating menu uh, tray inside the helmet. And this ended up being featured on the cover of Wired and is research that Dorit supported. So all these things come back together. And that's an example of how we sometimes can really enjoy the magic of a tough constraint to guide interesting design. So, yeah, I mean, actually every single problem we try to solve is a conundrum because uh, remember, we are trying to solve for providing everything that you would need to stay healthy and productive for a period of three years for a crew of anywhere between four and six people all contained essentially. So, so the idea is that there would be something waiting for the crew on the surface of Mars when they arrive for at least the seven month trip there, they would need to bring everything with them. And so providing a complete capability for monitoring their health and solving all the, all the medical problems, providing a complete food and water system like Ariel mentioned, uh, providing behavioral health solutions that are there uh, complete for them, pharmaceutical capability, uh, a gym to be able to stay um, productive and in, uh, in terms of you know muscles and and bones, um, training for any unknown scenarios that come up. So there's there's a lot of different things that we have to think about to provide all those capabilities. Um, in a very confined space without having access to a lot of different technologies. So we have to think about everything in terms of what is actually the minimal sort of needed thing, but also make it um, um, uh, feasible in space. So I'll give one specific example. So communication. Communication is absolutely key. And the furthest away we get from Earth, there's gonna be more and more of a lag of communication. So you really can't count on the ground to be able to give you um, feedback. But if you wanna communicate with your loved ones, which we know is really, really important for behavior health for the astronauts to be able to communicate with their families, how does one do asynchronous communication? Right. So one simple solution uh, that has we've come up with, or at least uh, some companies are working on, is actually doing a threading, just like you see sometimes in the email. Um, you know, the email um, applications will sort of group together the, the subject of your particular conversation. So in other words, you can answer a question and then maybe, and then maybe um, there's a 20 minute delay in communication and you're gone on to a different task and then you come back and answer, you know, so you're, you're keeping in line with that conversation. So you never really feel like you've lost 
touch or you're having to sit around waiting for that answer. I don't know if that's going to be as effective, but that's just one specific example how the lag in communication, for example, is something that we can creatively solve. And, and it's not just for space, right? Like sometimes here on Earth, there's lags of communication. You go into a place where there's a, a dead air space and you don't get answers. Yeah. I think Dorit brings up a great point, if I can just build on that briefly, Scott, that you're thinking about this panel being framed in extreme environments. There are so many design analogs between earth and space or space and the deep sea, where we think about design for the rigors of the space exploration environment. And then we're actually able to take some of that design and the hardware or even the use case and then think about them here on earth in, a, in another extreme environment. So there's wonderful crossover and games and simulation are very often a part of that. Well, then can you say, I mean, that was another question coming. So a, a good question would be to say, say a little bit more about uh, game, a game or a simulation that you think would be particularly interesting or illustrative. Oh my gosh, I have, I have a huge laundry list. And so I'm actually really excited to put this out before your participants because we are looking for these things. And if you have ideas that you wanna start developing them, we actually have money. Okay, these are this is NASA dollars. And like, like we invested in um, the MIT Media Lab, the Space Exploration Initiative, we would love to invest more in, in, in new ideas. So I'll give you my laundry list. Okay, so I'll start with the Mars simulator. We do not have a mission to Mars simulation. And what I'm envisioning is a game-like simulation. I mean, there's, you know, you could shoot up aliens and, and find treasures and all kinds of things in the gaming world. Why can't we actually create a Mars mission simulator where we can problem solve together for all kinds of unknown scenarios, you know? And so where you could collaborate together as a team, maybe Ariel and I could come in and you, Scott, and we can problem solve around something that the, you know, mission planners will throw at us, right? Like this is done all the time, uh, even for certain surgery or, you know, missions that you're doing in the military, people sort of play out scenarios. I want this to be fun. I want people to actually be able to, to have great graphics. Um, my second wish list is to have the, Mar the Mars matrix, okay? So I'm talking about a uh, a sort of a benevolent HAL 9000 for those of you who did watch 2010, but to be able to track you and to be able to tell you that you're a little off today, or maybe you didn't eat as much, or maybe your, you know, your um, exercise didn't go as long as you should have to maintain your bone and muscle and to really kind of nudge you into to playing out a really good behavior. So tracking your health remotely. Um, and there's a, a great company that actually came out of the media lab, uh, Dina Katabi's uh, Emerald, right? And we're funding them she's got a like the equivalent of a wi-fi box that can actually track your your um uh um all kinds of uh your um health signatures essentially without putting anything on you so that's a great start um my third, my third um, wish list is, a, is, the, is the Mars kitchen garden, okay? Like the foods that Ariel was talking about because we know we're not gonna be able to take fresh foods. We're not gonna be able to give them the experience of smelling fresh baked cookies or smelling coffee. Um, so how do we provide the sense through some kind of sensory you know, augmentation thing to make you feel like you're having a juicy burger and some fries you know, at, your local, at your local favorite uh, place? So maybe create you know, your favorite place in the, um, you know, the French Riviera, where you had a coffee one day, you know, so give you that experience. Otherwise, you know, the foods are going to be really boring. And then the training, the practicing procedures, especially medical procedures, let's gamify that. And there's companies that are doing that. So a company called Level X is actually gamifying, gamifying procedures for doctors. And so we really think that's critical. Um, the gym, let's make exercise really fun. So it's not the same old thing where you're just rowing all the time. I mean, that could get old after a while. And then finally, I want a Mars village. I want like to be able to create all kinds of people that will make you feel like you're interacting with a lot of people other than just like the three crewmates that you're on to be able to give you mental health. So that's my wish list. There's probably more, but those are all <laughs> things that we need to, to think about because as we solve for those things, we'll actually be able to figure out what technology are needed to be developed and created for them. I love what she mentions about these different scales of gaming and simulation environments. We are interested as well at the Media Lab at the different technologies that would support gaming interfaces or simulation interfaces for some of the scenarios that, um, that Trish is talking about. And one of the things that we think about, so at the lowest scale of size would be VR headsets. 
We're already learning so much from the VR gaming world and then translating this into the future of mission control, whether it's just to get us off the ground and get the mission started or supplying Dorit's wish for this mission control on Mars simulator. Then at the room scale, research within the responsive environments group at the Media Lab is looking at how do you tune all of the inputs in a room to the human physiology so you have a closed loop interaction system. So this means the color and the hue of the light, the intensity of the light, a projection screen, audio, temperature, localized personal temperature in a small room. And while part of this could be used for augmenting performance, right? So helping an astronaut or a crew member in a space station have the optimum environment for whatever task they're currently trying to do, whether it's relaxing, sleeping, or working and focusing, this can also be translated into the ultimate surround gaming environment and could also double as an entertainment sphere or a cosmos pod or something for those astronauts to help them with mental health. So we start at the VR level and then we think, okay, room level, how are we doing this at a, you know, kind of a built environment scale. And then what I love that Dorit mentioned is the Mars village. We're also thinking about near-term lunar settlement and then making it applicable as we think about governance on Mars. We need tools that allow people to game play and play test governance and coordination and collaboration of a community sharing resources like Settlers of Catan but for the surface of the moon and with a, a proper sense of sharing and collaboration and, and activity that's you know, in some way moderated by um, a governance institution. And so I think there's a wonderful opportunity there to think about gameplay and rules and structure as a way to get people thinking about that different mindset. And I'll just throw in a final plug to say, for my own PhD research, simulation inspired by video game rendering engines was actually a huge part of the work. We could have done the simulation entirely in Python or MATLAB, but we actually chose Cyberbotics, which is a robotic simulation platform that has graphics as good as what you say, this is going to date me a little bit, but like Halo or Call of Duty, like a very, very good first person view, richly envisioned world. And we wanted that to convey both the rigor of the physics, you know, collision engine for the actual items, in my case, self-assembling space architecture. But it was very important to us that it was visual and that it told a story and people could viscerally see how the space architecture was going to self-assemble and come together autonomously. So there's this wonderful crossover that we as engineers are now able to benefit, not just from the inspiration of science fiction, but also from some of the tools that have been built for games and gaming engines as well. So there's great cross-fertilization, I think, between the two worlds. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm finding this very cool. So it, what I'm also hearing is that you're talking both about these games and simulations as ways of helping somebody, some us, plan for the, for the mission, but also for uses in a mission. Um, I know you've got some support from NASA. Do you have a sense that they're fully on board with, uh, um, with the idea of, of particularly this, using the simulations and the planning? Do they, are they... I, what, I, what I'm thinking about is that frequently when you're working with large institutions, they think of games and simulations as nice to have, but, but frequently the, the energy all goes into the, um, I don't know, the more, uh, uh, the sort of more straightforward sort of calculating and you know, mo modeling. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, are, are they 100% behind these kind of more playful explorations? Um, Heck no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Getting a government organization to accept innovation is a very, a very challenging problem. But this is where we're going. Um, so I have to give NASA a ton of credit. They started our institute precisely for this because they recognized that uh, they need somebody to not only think outside the box, but think without a box. That's the whole idea. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were precisely put in place to do that. And we are working closely with the MIT Media Lab, just like Arielle was talking about, because they are also without a box. And um, so I think that change comes very slowly, especially for organizations that are big and have done things a particular way. But change does come. And the more we do these things and bring them to the forefront, we start with things that they absolutely must have. So when, when you absolutely have to have something, you will use it and you will become comfortable with it, right? So who can imagine now not having a smartphone? I mean, that was originally like a really big sort of transformation. A lot of people fought it for a long time, but it did happen, right? So, so um, 
2007, right, was the first iPhone. So it's been 13 years now, everybody's using it. Um, so the way we're starting and the way we get NASA to understand the, the importance of this is through the medical training games, okay? Mm -hmm. So right now, um, you know, you, you envision, um, well, not everybody is going to be medically trained, right, on the mission. They, they may have one person who's a doctor, but they may be asked to they may be asked to perform a procedure they haven't done since med school. I mean, you're going to try to predict ahead of time what they're going to need to do, but you just never know. So the only way to practice is using a simulation, using a game. And so you start with something that you know they're going to have to have, and then you build around that. So that's what we started with. We started with the medical procedure training, and now we're building an environment around that to include that and incorporate other elements like the behavior health. I'll let you talk, Ariel. Yeah. Um, we have, I will say, thanks to the mediation from Dorit, received wonderful support for really open-minded out of the box. So I don't necessarily interface directly with NASA as a big institution. Um, thanks to Dorit being the one that is supporting us through this. But I will say that thinking about MIT as a big institution with a very storied history in the Aero Astro Department and EAPS and elsewhere and Draper, having gotten the limb to the moon and written all that computing code for that, there is a certain emphasis on hard science and hard engineering, which we're very proud to also have as a core aspect of our platform. But there's a mischievousness at MIT that I really love. And some of it is cultivated uniquely at the Media Lab, but some of it is institute-wide with the history of hacks um, and the history of playful technology. And so the tagline for the space initiative as we were getting started a few years ago was actually space will be playful, space will be hackable. And we felt that it was uniquely suited to the MIT environment to be able to pull that off. So I think we've been fortunate to find the right niche and the right you know, set of creative people across MIT who are interested in that vision. That's good to hear. Um, I thought maybe we'll take a brief moment to um, you both provide us with videos and it's nice to sup. I mean, you've already given us a huge amount of information, but maybe supplement it with some visuals so people can uh, imagine more of what you're doing. So Rick, I just invite you to cue them up one right after the other uh, um, in, in any order, in either order, um, the two videos. So these are each about two or three minutes long. So.
When astronauts are on their way to Mars, we, we can expect them to be in a relatively small, confined space. Um, so they'll be dealing with uh, psychological issues related to isolation, confinement, lack of privacy. Um, and we think that, that virtual reality has an answer to, uh, to all of those issues. Uh, in, in researching this, this subject, we, we found that uh, one of the only constants in an astronaut's day is that they are exercising for uh, roughly two hours uh, every day. And so we saw this as the perfect opportunity to ingest a passive behavioral health countermeasure that, that uses VR um, into their daily fitness routine. So my name is Josh Rubin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company based in Houston, Texas called Z3 VR. And at Z3, we're building a platform called Colossum that's capable of ingesting biometric data pulled from augmented and virtual reality devices. Uh, we process that data and then abstract out useful behavioral and psychometric properties like cognitive load, stress, attention, engagement, emotional states. What we've done is we've built a virtual reality experience that integrates um, exercise equipment that's currently flying on the ISS, so specifically the MED2. Um, and we've also integrated several biosensors that are also flying as well, um, namely the Hexoskin and the Polar H10 uh, heart rate monitor. Astronauts are, as they're doing their, their daily exercise, they're now doing that inside of VR, playing uh, games. And so this uh, provides an opportunity for astronauts to, uh, to play and learn and create um, all while they're doing their, uh, their daily exercise program. Okay, well, those were both uh, fascinating. Um, I, I guess, oh, you're back on. Okay, we had to turn our video back on after, the, after those, um, those videos. Um, do either of you have anything you wanna add to what we just saw? Um, it's, it's just scratching the surface. I mean, honestly, we are in, it's like, I feel like we're in the stone age um, of where this needs to be. Uh, I, I really feel like we're at the cusp of a major revolution in terms of how we experience our world. I really do. And and I love space as, as a forcing function, sort of like as, is sort of the challenge to the, the problem that you need to solve, but, but it's gonna fundamentally change how we do things here on earth. We, we've already undergone a completely different way of working, right, with this pandemic. We're, we're problem solving around how we stay connected as, as members of communities or members of a working team. Um, and so it's just like a, a, a novel virus, space is a forcing function. And yes, there's definitely downsides to it, but I think there's also some wonderful things that have come out of it. And I can speak for myself. You know, I found a lot more time to do some quiet thinking and some quiet planning without a lot of distractions. There's less pressure on me to constantly be going out and socializing. Hey, my bank account is actually doing a little better than before. I'm not spending as much money on eating out. So there are some benefits to it, but I really feel like like life is going to change and we're just the beginning of that. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there are so many lessons to be learned from astronauts in this time period, but also other people that have conceived of how to live life in space for the social connection that they need to maintain, for the sense of distancing, for the remote learning and remote connection. And we're going to be hosting a workshop this week and next week at ours, um, ours Electronica, thinking about the future of social connectivity and how do we communicate learning these lessons from life in space, but very much bringing them back now to a civilization on earth that is in need of some of the same technologies and approaches and, and thoughtful opportunity for reconnection in the middle of a global pandemic and opportunity for games and play and relaxation. And I think of maybe more than we have in the past an intentional appreciation for mental health um, and thinking about this for a broad population. I wanted to mention something. So, uh, Ariel, I noticed in your in your video, Katie Coleman was was one of the participants on your zero G flight. So, Katie Coleman, for those who don't know, is a, is a retired NASA astronaut, a wonderful lady. Uh, her and Nicole Stott, who's also a former astronaut. Um, are going to participate in an event that we're putting on uh, with USA Today and Humana um, called Far From Alone. It's around uh, making people understand that as they're experiencing the pandemic and being in social isolation is not unlike a mission to Mars uh, or a mission that the astronauts have experienced. And what, one thing that was really interesting, Ariel, when I was sp speaking to Katie about this, 
um, and we talked about um, that what was important to the astronauts, and I know that, that you'll recognize this because when you you hosted the uh, uh, your event, the Space Week, uh, Katie was speaking about this during the panels, as were the other astronauts, the, feel, the overview effect. Yeah. So it was really important for the astronauts when they were far away from their family and friends, even for a period of up to a year, to look down and see the Earth. And, and photography is probably the most popular leisure activity that they do. <laughs> It's so important to their behavior health. And Katie brought this up. She said, we won't have a view on yeah. the way to Mars. We will not have a view. We will not be able to see the earth and feel connected to it. We will not have that overview effect. So what's critical is to replicate that. Is that it, will you get enough from a VR experience mm -hmm. to feel that connectivity? And when I spoke to Nicole Stott, who's an artist, and she did her watercolors in space, yeah. right? She did watercolors. And so... She said, will I be able to do my art? Well, okay, there's VR tools that you can use to paint. Like there's tilt brush, right? And you guys are working on being able to work on um, 3D virtual painting and things like that. There's tools, but what will inspire you? That was the thing that sort of came up. Will you be able to get the inspiration for doing those creative activities if you have nothing to look at? So um, it's still something we haven't solved yet, but I, I love getting that perspective from them. Any, any thoughts on that? I love the two that you picked, Nicole and Katie, because they both took steps to understand what they were passionate about from a, a play or a creativity sense. And Katie brought her flute and did a duet with, I believe, Jethro Tull, if I recall correctly. Um, and I think she brought it on both ISS missions. And then Nicole, of course, the famous watercolor and this beautiful sense of peace and, and her creative expression that she was able to include during a very task-oriented mission. And one of the things that they'll often talk to you about is this red line that passes over their schedule during the day, telling them exactly where they have to be. And they so treasure in their you know, storytelling to us those moments where they can be human and be free of a task and really express themselves in a way like exactly what Teresa is saying with these different opportunities. And one of the things that they crave is that, that grounding that you get by looking back on the earth. And Bill Andrews has known this since Apollo 8 and other missions. And it's an interesting challenge to think about how we give that sense of visual stimulation, but with a true emotional connection that's not just from looking at a screen and how, yeah, how we can think about replicating that for long duration missions. Very interesting question. Are there things that, uh, you know, we obviously have had now years of, um, of space station missions and people in space for a fairly long time. Um, are there interesting uh, practices or patterns of behavior that have emerged from people that, that we wouldn't have perhaps thought of, but that you now, that you now take as sort of um, fundamental to understanding what life is like in, in, in yes. uh, that kind of isolation? A hearty yes. Now, some of it is isolation and some of it is the nature, almost the industrial design of the environment. And so one of the constraints to go back to, you know, circle back to a point that you had raised earlier that inspires much of our work within the portfolio, our research portfolio for the Space Initiative is thinking about the unique affordances of designing for life in microgravity. So I'll give you a couple of very explicit um, answers here. The first is that the tops of your feet wear down, not the bottoms, because you have no need for soles, you're not gravity bearing on the bottom of your feet, but you are slipping your toes under straps to keep yourself relatively positioned, otherwise you would float away. And so one of our designers, Sans Fish for the Space Initiative, has looked at 3D printing custom shoes that have essentially flipped the sole on the other way. Another wonderful story that Katie and Paolo, um, an astronaut from ESA and their buddies, they've flown together, that they tell is that Paolo, it was very important to him that the crew came together for a communal meal, that they had this cultural moment and this cultural element. And there was no, originally there was no kind of central gathering point. Then they had rigged up this square, flat, you know, area table and Paolo was bruising himself on it repeatedly. Many of the astronauts were as they were flying by. And so then they realized that they wanted a central meeting place, but there was no need for it to be rectilinear and aligned with the floor in the way that we think about on earth. And so he just tilted it. And so there it was a tilted dinner table. And of course they're Velcroing things to it or using it in a different fashion, but it was an interesting combination of 
the core human need for a social connection and coming together with friends, but with the flexibility to actually design for the uniqueness of your environment. You can tilt the table, you can move it out of your way and you still get that, that notion of being connected. So those are two examples that we think about when how has that environment particularly shaped patterns of behavior? To your question. Yeah, that's a fantastic example. I was going to use the table, the table example. It's such a good one. Uh, shared meals is really important. You know, it's really very interesting. But on the International Space Station, it's it's actually a fairly big place, especially when you have an international crew. Um, you, you hear this from astronauts that sometimes you can go an entire day and not see your crewmates because you're working in your respective areas and you've got something you're really engrossed with. And so having that shared meal at the end of the day was really critical um, to get together. And so you can envision even on a mission to Mars that you may be so busy that they just like here on Earth, it's important to come together. So uh, we, we, we have learned a lot from that. But I think for me, what was most impactful is, is how important seeing the view of Earth and, and the communication. So the communication was critical. So for example, one of the most important things that the crew has said, they needed to know that their families were okay. They needed to know that in order to not worry and really focus on their jobs. So the concern for us is thinking about the communication delays and not being able to play with Jethro Tull because you don't, you have a communication delay of 20 minutes. How, how do we overcome that? That's actually something that, like I said, we haven't solved that problem yet. Um, so I'm going to try to pick up on some questions that have come in through the, um, from our viewership. Um, and it's, one is sort of building on what we were just talking about. We were talking about things, emergent behaviors from, um, uh, from, previous missions and the que I guess I want to just sort of say, are there emergent behaviors around play or, or face, say sports? So for example, in zero gravity, are people inventing new games or new ways of playing? Uh, you you know. know, so, so a great person to look up is Don Pettit. Um, if you guys don't know about Don Pettit, he's probably one of the most playful astronauts I've ever <laughs> seen. And he's got, he's truly a child He's an engineer child um, and he just explores for the heck of it. I mean, the, he did so many experiments in space just for the heck of it. And it, he's discovered so many things and it's just wonderful. So um, I, I highly recommend that you look up Don Pettit YouTube videos on his play in space. So in answer to your question, like you heard from Ariel, a lot of the astronauts are musical. So uh, Chris Hadfield played his guitar a lot in space. There were others as well that played music, musical instruments in space. Unfortunately, on the way to Mars, I don't think they're going to be able to bring musical instruments because I think the, the trade analysis will not allow it. Essentially, you, you might as well bring more food and water than a musical instrument. So we're going to have to get creative around how they can produce music and probably synthesized music will be will be something that um, we have to give them uh, access to. Interesting. Um, I had not yet thought about that. That issue where you would, yeah, for the mass to be able to go to Mars, you're probably not going to be able to have the same freedom and the flexibility of the astronauts bringing their special talismans or their objects with them. That's a whole nother set of interesting constraints, um, just the mass budget for that mission. And Scott, to your question about sports, I can't say that I know off the top of my head great examples of you know, complex sports or activities. Of course, they have the exercise equipment, but I will say that something that is a little counterintuitive if you're thinking about designing a game for the inside of a space station environment or something is when you do throw a ball, right, the basis of many sports for humanity, in our um, physical model, you know, our physics model of how the world works, we always throw it with an arc because we're used to that, um, you know, Newton's laws and the, and the kinematic motion equations. But in microgravity, you actually want to just try to shoot it in a straight line vector to your partner uh, or to your opponent. And so just a little tidbit there. Um, it's interesting to think about, again, the nature of this unique environment changing how sports or games would be played. Cool. Very cool. Um, another question is, um, and you've sort of hinted at some of this, but um, since only a few of us will be able to make the journey, mm -hmm. um, I guess the uh, what technologies will enable the rest of us to feel present or, or to somehow join them? Uh, I think, I think when they go, all of humanity will be going and I'm sure that there's going to be uh, as much video feed as possible. Um, and you know, they're, they're, they're going on behalf of all of humanity. 
Having said that, that's the trip to Mars. But I firmly believe, I really do, that there that space is going to be a lot more affordable and accessible to a lot of people, more than you envision today. It's going to get cheaper and cheaper and safer. And so our mission is to enable all of all of humanity, all humans to be able to go um, to space. And so I, I really see this moment as sort of like how it was in a hundred years ago when commercial aviation started, you know, emerging, right? Because who would have envisioned a hundred years ago that we could all jump on a plane and be, you know, around the world in a few hours. And so I really see that happening. But I, I think that uh, to answer the, the question specifically, we are going to be able to uh, go along with them as much as, as, as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked about whether there's a role for robots in helping simulate um, human connection. Um, I realize that neither of you are working on that question, but are you aware of any? Well, we've, we've, lo we've looked at this. So, um, so it's going to be what, what robotics people call a mixed model, a mixed model of executing certain tasks that are either uh, physically repetitive or something that requires really fine um, precision, right? That there, there will be a robotic element to the Mars mission. Absolutely. There will be a robotic element, whether the robot will have a humanoid face, probably not. It'll probably be an arm of some sort that one could, could work with. The biggest issue we see with robots is, uh, trust, the human really has to trust the robot. And I think that in a lot of instances you find, especially those that are very capable in manipulating things, um, engineers and pilots, et cetera, they, they, like, they, they trust themselves more than they trust the robot. And so I think that that can be a problem. And so that also requires a lot of training, just like training with your crewmates you have to train with the robot so that you have to learn instances in which you can trust the robot versus instances where it's appropriate for you to take over. So I hope that answers the question. That's great, great. Yeah. Um, I think I have time for one more. Um, someone, someone's asked, has the entertainment industry been paying attention to your work um, to integrate into uh, space-based film and television? Have you heard from Hollywood? Yes. <laughs> so one of the missions of the Space Exploration Initiative is to engage artists and designers and Hollywood producers with the scientists and engineers that are all together co-creating our space future. And so we host a massive event typically every year in March. We didn't get a chance to do it in March this year because of the pandemic, but we are going to reboot it for the coming year. And we bring together J.J. Abrams and Neil Stevenson and astronauts and CEOs from the top space companies and new space age startups um, and our amazing representatives from Trish and other scientists to be in the same rooms together, hear the same content, but then also get down to business and workshops and begin to put those creative minds together across those different disciplines. And so, yes, we do work with Hollywood. We have tried to pitch JJ on a few interesting ideas and get the arc and that cycle going because science fiction inspires us. And now we are working on this next generation of prototypes to inspire science fiction that can go even further and complete this, this wonderful give and take. So I, I wanna answer this. I don't I know you're running out of time, but um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Netflix just launched its uh, season one of a new uh, uh, show called Away, okay? Mm -hmm. And they've got 10 episodes. It's Hillary, Hillary Swank, and she, she does a brilliant job. It's about a mission to Mars, about a, really focused on a, on a small crew of five people. And uh, our team has decided to watch everything except for the season finale, and we're all getting together this week to watch the season finale together. So I watched nine episodes, okay? But it's fantastic. It really gets into a lot of the behavior health issues. Um, and also the time delay, all those things. And so this was actually a show that um, brought in some of the NASA experts. Uh, astronaut Mike Massimino was a, an advisor on the show. In fact, he makes a cameo in, in the first episode, so it's fun to watch for him. But anyway, um, my favorite part so far is uh, the crew surgeon gets sick. He gets, he gets a reactivation, I think, of Epstein-Barr virus. So he gets basically mononucleosis on board. And they're all gearing up in their like sickness gear and stuff and then he falls he's really sick and he falls and he like injures himself in his crew quarters okay and they get out the staple gun i mean it was a plain staple gun to staple his back and i'm like oh my gosh no <laughs> but 
yes, I think ho uh, Hollywood is paying attention to these things. And for us, it's fun because we actually live and breathe this every day. But to see how other people interpret how to solve a problem uh, is really fun for us and inspiring as well. So it sounds like you weren't spending too much time yelling at the screen saying, no, it doesn't go that, yeah. that way. <laughs> I find that whenever I watch a movie with, for which I have any technical knowledge, you know, they're actually the brain myself. The um, biggest flop is when they run out of water and she's turning on a faucet and they're in zero gravity. I was like, wait a minute, the <laughs> they're not going to have a faucet like that. <laughs> well, um, you guys have been great. Um, we're going to ask you to stick around. Uh, we're going to end the YouTube broadcast, but there's some people who are here for our workshop and we're inviting them. They're going to join uh, join the webinar so they can talk to you some more. For those of you who've been tuned in on YouTube, thanks for being here. Uh, I hope this was worth your time. It certainly was exciting for me to hear all about all this. And uh, thank you. Um, and we'll say goodbye to everyone there on YouTube. <laughs>